So, uh, good morning. I'm joined today for an interview with an Irish man with German roots as well. Uh, it's Sean Patrick Pokal, and he's written this book called Inspired and Inerrant, uh, A New Guide to the Old Testament. And uh, Sean, I met him, I met you in Knock a few weeks ago, and I was just fascinated by the fact that you'd written a book. You're a layman. You're not a professional theologian. And uh, I just thought I'd uh, get you on and to do an interview on this book. And, uh, and I wonder, can you just walk us through your faith journey and how you came to write this book and your love for sacred scripture? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on, Robert. It's a pleasure to be on your show. So my faith journey, uh, well, I suppose just a bit about myself. Um, my dad's German, and my mother's Irish. They met on the Canary Islands and got married shortly thereafter. Uh, I was born in Germany and so were my two siblings. And then when I was five years old, we moved to Ireland and mm. we've been living here ever since. Uh, growing up in Ireland, then going through primary school, we would have gone through the sacraments, First Holy Communion and Confirmation. And then into secondary school, it was really a turn into a spiritual desert in that regard. So. Uh, having gone from a lot of faith, even though the topic for another day, uh, not well founded as such, but still it was there. We still uh, we, we would pray regularly and we'd know be our father and we'd bless ourselves and things like that. But then going into secondary school, uh, that was all practically gone. Yeah. Um, so that was a, a big change. I went to an Irish speaking secondary school, a Gaelic school, and I did the leaving search through Irish. Wow. Uh, but during those times, uh, during those uh, final years there, when I was 17, 18, I fell into a depression and I was not doing well mentally uh, or psychologically either. Uh, after leaving start, I went to uh, the University of Limerick and I studied, uh, did a degree in European studies. And while I was there, I met some Christians and I started joining some Christian groups, uh, Pentecostals and Baptists mainly. Uh, but mostly non-denominational, multi-denominational, really. Mm -hmm. As part of my degree course, I went to Denmark for, uh, for five months for work experience. And then afterwards, I went on the Erasmus study abroad to Spain for another six months. And it was during, that, uh, during those years, really, that uh, my faith started to, to, to increase. And I started coming back to the Catholic faith as well. So before I went on those study abroad programs, I did... Uh, I had uh, I was given a Bible and I had read through it and I decided to give my life to Jesus and I became born again, as it were. And then from there on, uh, providentially, uh, God placed a lot of faithful and fervent Catholics in my life. And they would explain the Catholic faith to me in a way that I had never uh, it had never been explained to me before. So yeah. and then, uh, during my time in Spain, I would go to mass every day. Uh, there was a church just 10 minutes away, so I would go to mass there. And then when I came home, I was fully back in the faith yeah and from there then uh little by little i started working my way through the bible again and i did a little uh little course on the new testament on, on basic exegesis and hermeneutics how to interpret scripture now this was from a protestant perspective but then as i grew strong in the catholic faith i looked at it from the catholic perspective and then i thought i'd love to do something along those lines with the old testament so i started mm -hmm. working my way through the old testament with a catholic lens and I started taking notes, but those notes soon turned into paragraphs, paragraphs turned into chapters, and I thought, oh, I can't keep this to myself, so I'll do something more with it. And then the result after two years was this book, The Inspired and Inerrant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I was fascinated when we were talking and knock. Um, it's great to see, you know, when a lay person, a layman like you, that, you know, gives us life to trying to understand the faith better, because this is really our mission as laymen in the church now is to bring other laity up with us uh, who love the Eucharist, who love sacred scripture and who want to know Christ more, because it's a fascinating journey that we're on. And uh, I was, when I was, when I got the book from Amazon. I said, "This is five hundred pages," and the footnotes. And I said, "You know, I, I can see the German side of you really coming through." But I just thought this is really 
really an amazing work to, for 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 someone like you to have done uh, because there's many people in the church that will have all of the resources given to them they'll have done their doctorates in rome uh, and so forth and they will never have gone to this level and i suppose like what i saw was the holy spirit really working working in the book and through you like i i've even been using it for reference um, I have it here beside my desk and, I, and I'm picking it up and referencing stuff off the Old Testament so that you can bounce, bounce um, like it's a book you can dig into if you want to look at a specific um, a specific book in the Old Testament. That's how I I'm enjoying I'm enjoying it that way. And uh, I mean, as you said, I think Catholics are desperately uninformed on sacred scripture. Like, what, 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 what do you think we could do as laymen to better educate Catholics around Ireland on sacred scripture, on the Word of God? How can we better engage this Catholic generation with the Word of God? Yes. Well, first of all, I would say that the teaching of scripture that falls within the primary responsibility of the priests it should really be taught from the pulpit at mass but then where that isn't done where the lay people have to step up uh, definitely I would encourage the formation of bible study groups I myself I lead a bible study group here in my home parish uh, which I've been a part of now for two years but uh, I didn't start it it was there before and I just ended up uh, volunteering and uh, taking over leadership of it but um, I would strongly encourage that to uh, have, have group meetings to get together to discuss scripture and then to look at the church's teaching on those scripture passages, look at the church fathers, look at the catechism, how do we interpret this? Because that's the beauty as well of our Catholic faith is that uh, the interpretation is given to us. It's not left to ourselves, because as we can see, unfortunately, with our Protestant friends, if you give uh, 10 people a Bible and tell them to interpret something, you'll get 10 interpretations. And now there's something like 30,000 different <laughs> churches, denominations who each claim to have been inspired by the Holy Spirit and to have the interpretation of what a certain passage means. So yes, yeah, so I would encourage the formation of Bible study groups to read it, to just uh, dedicate some time during the day. Uh, I'd encourage every Catholic to pray the rosary at least once a day and then to read some scripture as well. Uh, preferably uh, try to get through the gospels once a year and then mm -hmm. read some chapters, maybe the chapter or two from one of the other books, especially those that you aren't familiar with. And I know some of them can be a bit tedious, especially uh, the earlier ones in the Old Testament. But again, that's what uh, this book was designed to do to help you get through that, to get an understanding of why that's there and why it's important and how that is fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, and did anybody in the church encourage you to write this book? Or is this really the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Is this all coming through your prayer? Or, or how, how did you manage to, 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 you know, compile all of this? It was mainly through prayer. Yes. Mm. As, I, as I said, uh, it started off just as notes to myself. I didn't set out to write a book. So it mm. uh, just turned into a book along the way. But mm. um, when I told others about it, about the project before it was completed, I was met with a lot of encouragement from priests yeah. and from my Catholic friends. So there was encouragement there and that, uh, give me the motivation to to continue and I'm very very happy with with the result yeah yeah no it's 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 fascinating um and do you think you will expand on this project or what what are you where do you think we could this could go in the church uh, what what areas could this expand out to in Ireland apart from study groups do you think we there could be more like online sessions or online groups or something like that Oh, yes, definitely teaching sessions uh, also to go into uh, creativity as well. Um, we mustn't underestimate the power of of the visual arts as well, mm. and especially the, the, the Bible, all of the Bible, Old and New Testament gives us so much material uh, in terms of the wisdom books with the its beautiful poetry, but also the narratives, the history of it. There's a lot of episodes from the Bible uh, that could be put to, to film. In a, yeah. in a respectful and reverent way and that would open it up to others who might find reading a bit tedious but um if it's done accurately and in a in a reverent way then that would also open up a lot of new avenues to to evangelize and to bring people yeah. to the faith yeah um i presume then you saw the chosen what what were your thoughts on the chosen when you, if you if you've seen it i'm not sure if you've seen it 
I have seen it, yes. I saw the first yes. two seasons. Um, when I first came across it, I was fascinated by it. I practically binged watched season one. <laughs> and then uh, slowly but surely, some mixed reviews started coming through. I listened to other uh, perspectives on it. And there are some issues I take with it, certain characters, I don't like the way they're portrayed. And so there's, there's, there's pros and cons to it. Uh, it is really an interfaith and multi-denominational project, and you can see that elements of that in certain episodes, uh, certain things that might not be as historically accurate as, as, as some people would like. But um, overall, I think it, I think it was it's a good initiative. I hope that good comes from it. Um, but again, I would be careful not to, as I suppose with any film based on, on scripture, not to base your faith on that film. Another beautiful mm. example would be the Prince of Egypt film that I loved mm. uh, growing up. But again, there are some certain things that uh, that uh, the producers took some uh, liberalities with, just to to make uh, to focus more on a good story as opposed to accurately depicting what the scriptures tell us. So that would just be my word of caution. But for those who haven't watched The Chosen, I'd say yeah, give it a go. And if you like it, good. If you don't like it, fine. Yeah. But um, don't throw all your eggs into that basket. Is all I yeah. would say. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I definitely agree. I, I was, I was watching it as well, and I did. There's some scenes I did find very, very beautiful. Uh, I, I did think, you know, there are scenes where you see them taking notes, where one of the apostles is going taking notes, which, which I don't think uh, was historically accurate. But I suppose it's very easy to give criticism when you're not when if people are going to criticize it well what are we offering as an alternative and very very few people groups have given an, an alternative to the chosen and very very few people in the church are are, are are taking the time to to take notes of the old testament um and and you know i wish we had more of this in the church we do we have been doing a bible study in, in a prayer group that i go to that we have been going through saint john slowly going through the gospel of saint john in in, in a group and it's and it's and it's incredible to you know to read the gospel to hear it explained and uh, to and uh, to discuss it in a group uh, it, it just expands out sacred scripture so much more um and um and this is the great tragedy of catholicism that we don't know Still today in 2022, most Catholics don't know the sacred scripture. My kids have gone through primary school and secondary school. Never once, never once been asked for a Bible to bring to school. The Bible isn't part of the Catholic curriculum. Well, there isn't a Catholic curriculum. It's not part of religious education. And we're, tr we're trying to form a generation of Catholics that have never read the Bible. It's quite sad, you know. Um, I don't know what you what you think of that, or because you've gone through it. You're younger than me, so you would have went through a Catholic education earlier than me. What 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 are your thoughts on that, or your experience? Yes, no, I just, I definitely agree. Um, and just thinking back as well, in in primary school, we were given the names of certain of the Bible figures, some catchy songs. Um, when I was when I was there, we were using that Alive O program. <laughs> had its flaws but it at least it had some memorable things uh, yeah. like the names of the prophets that I always remembered that there was a prophet called Elijah and Ezekiel um, even though I never came across them again until uh, reading the bible for myself then years later uh, but at, since then that has been replaced with another program which I think is even is even more barren uh, yeah. in terms of faith formation yeah it seems as the focus just seems to be on feeling good on being nice to people but what about actual love and worship of God of keeping the commandments and what do those mean and how did God work through people in history you know that seems to be sort of oh no we don't want to just push one religion there's loads of religions and uh, so we have to just find the common denominator and you know th things like that so so yes I think a lot of work needs to be done and that's again where lay people will have to step up uh, especially the the, the families and the faith communities they will have to do their role in catechizing their children and and their friends as well and um, not being afraid to you know to speak up and say well actually the church teaches this or actually uh, our lord has taught us this and uh, so just to to take that uh, into into account yeah absolutely uh, you you're in Athenry parish correct in in, in correct, Cam yeah. 
can't be Galway. So you're lucky you have one of these, the famous Father Brendan Kilcoyne in your parish. So uh, you couldn't have found a better priest to give you encouragement. Uh, and are you from that parish or did you did you move there or is that your home parish? This is my home parish, yes. Okay. We moved here okay. In, all the way back in 1999, just before the, the turn of the millennia. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've been here ever since. Yeah, no, it's great. There's lots of good things happening around this this part of the world, and uh, you do see we do we do see uh, now as we network more uh, what's happening on the ground in Ireland, and uh, you know it, it's given great great encouragement. But um, I do think Scripture and and the, and the Eucharist in Our Lady, if we if we use these tools in the church. If, if every Catholic knew the Bible, if we all understood grace and the Eucharist and Our Lady uh, and these basics of Catholicism, I think Ireland would, would be, our faith would be renewed, would be restored because we would have a more beautiful, authentic, uh, real living church. Um, and sadly today it's become very, you know, most Catholics have never read a Bible we've 800,000 students in catholic education in our in in catholic schools in ireland 800,000 primary secondary and the bible isn't part of their education it's not required they don't have to buy one it's not on the book list uh, which i find incredibly sad you know it's like what's the point in all this catholic infrastructure and they've never read the bible you know which is you know i i i don't know what what your thoughts are on that Yes, I know it is. It is incredibly sad, and it's such a tremendous gift as well to have, to have the written word, the word of God. Because, uh, as we know, our uh, the deposit of faith consists of, of two parts: the sacred tradition and sacred scripture. Um, and as Catholics, we're lucky; we actually have more books in our Bibles than our Protestant friends, because fortunately, seven books were removed uh, by certain not denominations during the time of the Reformation or the Protestant Revolt. Um, and uh, so we actually have, have an advantage in that sense as well, that our, our library, as it, as it were, our library of sacred scripture is more extensive and it covers more ground as well, because in those books that were removed, we see uh, early Old Testament references to the matters, of, uh, certain matters such as uh, praying to the saints, intercession of the saints, uh, angels, purgatory, and uh, the, the final judgment, life after death, things like that. So um, def definitely, and and uh, as, as well, we see the um, we see the hand of God working through all of human history from from the from the earliest times right into then the incarnation, the coming of our Lord. Um, that again is what what my book tries to do is to to show those prophecies and mm. the typology, what came before, and then how is that fulfilled? What is the meaning of that? And how do we uh, how do we practice our faith now with, with that in mind? It gives us a deeper appreciation of it, especially in terms of of the Holy Eucharist, when we understand mm -hmm. that the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is based on the sacrificial system of ancient Israel, and how their worship services used to work. Uh, we see that especially in, in Leviticus, one of the most hated books of the Bible, because it's so mm -hmm. tedious to get through and uh, very technical, very legalistic. But still, when we understand what that actually says. And we see, we know uh, how the mass works and we see the parallels there. We see the order. It follows the same order, starting off with the penitential rite, asking for forgiveness. We see a Gloria, giving glory and praise to the Lord. We see the reading of scripture, reading out of the word. And then we come to the offertory, offering gifts, offering sacrifices. And then the priest offers the sacrifice on behalf of the people. We see all of that perfectly fulfilled uh, in, in the Eucharist, which our Lord instituted at the Last Supper. Mm. Uh, same for Our Lady as well, how Our Lady is prefigured by the great women of the Old Testament and uh, then uh, her, her fulfillment in her, the, the Blessed Virgin in the New Testament. So there's all these little things that, um, especially uh, what Catholics are criticized for, for, for making things up or from focusing on tradition, but we say, no, actually it's, it's there, it's in scripture, it's hidden in plain sight. But again, it has to be taught, it has to be discovered and revealed. Uh, uh for us to to gain the full merits and fruits of that 
Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, just out of curiosity, which book in the Old Testament, uh, which part of this book did you like most? Or what's your favorite note that you've taken out of this uh, 500 pages? Oh, that's difficult. I suppose one that I keep going back to is uh, in the chapter on the books of Samuel. Yeah. Uh, about the Ark of the Covenant. Ah. And how that prefigures uh, Our Lady, who is the Ark of the New Covenant. And then the fascinating parallels between David, who receives the Ark, and then the visitation in the Gospel of Luke. So that was when I discovered that, I was fascinated by that. So I really liked that. Another section I really liked was the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Yeah. Isaiah, especially his vision in Isaiah chapter 6 with the seraphim. Um, so yeah. uh, that's the scene that, that always fascinated me. So yeah. yeah. Samuel and Isaiah, I think, were, were my favourites to, to write in this book. But yeah. I, I, I love them all. And whichever book of scripture I happen to be reading at the moment, that is my favourite book. At that, at yeah, that. yeah. There was one um, experience that I had of sacred scripture. It was probably the most moving and deep experience I had in my life, which was in the old 1955, pre-1955 uh, Easter, Easter vigil, they used to have the 12 prophecies. Uh, they'd read out 12 pieces of scripture, which got removed afterwards. Uh, but we once went to uh, a Latin mass, but we read all of the 12 prophecies in, in English. So 12 people stood up uh, during the mass and they read out the, the 12 prophecies. And I remember my kids were there with them. So they could they were listening to all of the scripture being read out at mass. Um, and it was pr I will never forget uh, how the sacred scripture totally turned that mass alive in a way that I'd never seen before and I do wonder in a sense you know with the reforms over the years have we lost that mystery of of of, of focusing on those on the prophecies in the old testament on um at easter because like you said all of what was accomplished at calvary was prefigured in the old testament I don't know have you ever seen it or what are your thoughts on that or if you've heard of that Oh, yes, yes. But um, yeah, definitely, there has been, a, unfortunately, a cutting down of, mm. of scripture in the liturgy as well. And I don't know what the main reason or what the official main reason is. Some people might say, oh, just to save time. But I mean, the, for me, that's just a, a very uh, weak excuse, because what else should we be doing on Easter for the Easter Vigil, but to praise and worship the Lord, the fact that he is risen and to see that. Uh, in our sacred texts um, but um, no definitely the, uh, the the importance of scripture in, in the liturgy and of the prophecies to understand that uh, we cannot underestimate that yeah but again everything has gone so so plain everything again like as I mentioned before trying to find that the lowest common denominator and just trying to find something that would make everyone happy which of course is impossible you can never please everyone uh, but we as Catholics, we should be pleasing God first and foremost, yeah. what gives yeah. God the glory as opposed to what makes us feel good <laughs> about ourselves, especially yeah. in the context of the Mass, which is not about us, but rather uh, about the, the unbloody sacrifice of Calvary uh, to be there for, 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 for our Lord. Yeah. So again, yes, uh, really, we, we, sh we shouldn't underestimate the, the power of those prophecies just by reading the word, reading the mm. word of God. There's so much power from that and so much strength as well. I remember when I was in my lowest moments uh, going through depression and I just read some scripture passages, just the uh, comfort that came from that. Because again, we, we know that these words are inspired by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit works through them. Each time we, we read those and each time the word is proclaimed. So there is so much power in it. So it is, it is a great disappointment if, if it's uh, cut out for whatever reason and if people are just not hearing it. Because it is our spiritual food, uh, Eucharist, of course, is is our our nourishment. But then also the Word of God is also nourishment for us. And again, if that's if we're deprived of that, then we would we are so to speak malnourished in the spiritual yeah. sense. We're not getting everything that our Lord has supplied us with. So definitely, we, we should we should bear that in mind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's. It'll take a few years now for us really to to build to build um, you know build the Catholic faith back up in Ireland so that we have this authentic encounter with Christ. Uh, too many people, 
you know, when they hear the word Catholic Ireland or Catholic Church in Ireland, they get a particular view, which is based on what the media has portrayed us. And reality, we have to lead souls back to Christ, you know, and I, I just think um, I just think. Um, Sean, I, I think the Holy Spirit and Christ are calling you to some mission in Ireland. It's quite incredible. Um, I, and I do I do hope to see this expanded out uh, across Ireland. I, I, I think there's a whole there's a whole island now to evangelize. Maybe some some German guardian angel has sent your father here for a reason, I think. You know, we, we we and uh, and it's great to hear. You know, I I I I I I second what you're saying. So many people suffer in silence about mental health issues, depressions, and so forth, and we forget that uh, if we hand those problems to Christ, He He transforms us. Said, look, I can't do this today, today, Lord. I'm in a dark place, but I know if I go to You, You're going to help me. And we don't open that door to souls, which is very, very sad. We don't say to souls, look, you don't have to suffer. You can go to Christ. He, he will transform your life. Let him into your life. And, um, you know, if we're not giving sacred scripture and the, and the Eucharist, where are we going? I don't know. Um, but uh, what I don't know, uh, I just, there's one thing that I saw in the Camino. I went into a church and they had all of the different Bibles in different translations. I think, well, not all of them, but they had 40 different translations in front of the Eucharist. And I thought it was beautiful. Anybody walking in there could just pick up a Bible in their language and meditate on it in front of the Eucharist. I think there's nothing more profound or beautiful, no? No. It's... Yeah. So, um. Sean, I, th I think we, it'd be interesting to, to delve a bit more into your book. I don't know if you podcast on this or, or if you're blogging about it, but it'd be great to, to go into it a bit more. Um, because I said, like, I'm getting a lot from it. Um, you know, I mean, it's pro God's providence put you in my life. And I, and I, and I really do, in, I really do find it, um, you know, so nourishing to see your commentary on it. Um, and it has the approval of the Archbishop of Tum. So the, 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 some priests have obviously taken the time to read through. And Thomas Crean, the, the, the Dominican, has reviewed it as well. So there's a few, few expert theologians that have gone through your work. Um, I, I'd, I would like to see if in the future, if you, are you considering uh, expanding this work in the church? Are you going to blog about it? uh or do a course on it what, what what where do you think think you'll you'll see this work going oh definitely i would like to do more with this um i have started a, a sort of a blog i have a website where i write some of my thoughts down uh recently i started working on a series of novels it was only mm. meant to be one novel but it was too long so i had to cut into three parts so the first part is out and i'm currently proofreading part two but um, so the blog is uh, going to try and uh, talk a bit about that. But this book as well, and I have a small YouTube channel as well, very small, um, where I went through the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Okay. Um, just for people who would uh, who would be interested in brushing up on on that, because um, the Roman Catechism that I have um, mightn't be for all of them, but the scripture references in that. Uh, it quotes the the Bible, but it doesn't give you where what book it's from or what chapter and verse. So in those YouTube, in that series of YouTube videos I did, I, I gave all those references and I read through each uh, each chapter step by step, about 40, 45 minutes uh, worth of videos. So I did a series on that. If people would be interested in checking that out, but definitely I need to do more on the uh, Old Testament, uh, which I hope to do in the near future when I start to get uh, my my routine properly sorted out and definitely yeah. something i'm going to look into that's amazing yeah and i i'd be i definitely be fascinated to listen to that series on the council of trent um it's always i think it's great for catholics to know to know the 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 two catechisms the the old and the new because um, um the new catechism will challenge will clarify challenges that we face in the world today that wouldn't have been there 500 years ago, for example, euthanasia, which wouldn't have been something that 
how do we teach on it today and how can we inform Catholics today? So it's, it's, it's good that we get both of them. And, uh, and I think it's fascinating. You did that, that series. I'm definitely going to put a link down below after this, uh, on, 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 on to, to your, to your, um, series, but, um, Sean, I, thanks for your time uh, for, for discussing your book. And uh, as I said, I want to give you as much encouragement as, as I can. Um, you're a great man for having taken this on board and for showing, you know, your love for the faith as a layman. And because, uh, you know, I think it's, it's critical in the church that we, 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 we do more of this and, and we, we support ourselves and that we're growing the faith here in Ireland. And, uh, I do encourage people to leave their comments below and I'll put a link to your book on Amazon, um, Inspired and Inerrant, A New Guide to the Old Testament by Sean Patrick uh, Pokal. Is that how you pronounce your surname? That's correct. And it's, I am, I, I just think it's, it's brilliant. It's absolutely, fa I'm fascinated. I was fascinated when I got it the first day I said, oh, I, I thought when you said you had written it, it was a few, it was a little booklet and I didn't think it was a, it was so big, but um, uh, I'm just going to show you one of the books because you're, you're a German. I got this book on the sacrifice of the mass and it was written by German. So this is the, <laughs> it, it was translated in the last century, but you'll like this. It was the holy sacrifice of the mass and it goes through everything. Uh, about the 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 sacrifice of the mass written by germans so germans have a good mind and uh when when they get engaged with the faith they're just incredible um, it can go both ways but <laughs> as we see with the synodal process well that's for sure it's um it's interesting when you contrast the spirituality of the irish and the germans the irish have a lot of devotion so they believe but they don't know what they believe and they wouldn't be able to make a defense for it and the germans are the complete opposite they know the faith but they just don't have the faith. <laughs> like even my German relatives and friends, like they know all the Bible studies and they know what the church teaches, but just no. <laughs> so it's like it's, two, two extremes. <laughs> isn't that amazing? I, I love that. I mean, it's it's very true. Irish are very devotional. It's just that. And but even but when you lose even the devotion, that the faith is lost. Mm -hmm. And this is where you know I'm I'm lucky. I had I had nine years of formation outside of Ireland and and was able to know my faith better and I come back to Ireland and you do find the, this great void and it's even among the clergy there's a void among the clergy they don't know the faith they're not able to teach the faith and this is the sad sad reality and I just think you're, you're hitting so many nails on the head with your book and your your vision and view of the faith, which you know is profound, and you and you've got a great priest there in the parish. So, uh, I do want to encourage you, Sean. Please keep blogging and writing. I, I think you have so much to offer the Irish Church, and I and I hope us Irish appreciate all the work you're doing and any support we can give you. We we'll let just we we'll let you know. But um, uh, once your other book is published, just let let me know. We'll do a, an interview on it and. And, and try and promote it around Ireland. Thank you very much, Robert. Okay. Okay. Thank you. God bless, Sean. And we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Okay.